Hello, welcome to this live video today. So I wanted to do a pretty pretty casual video today and I don't know why, I just kind of felt inspired. I was having, having a few conversations in Messenger and I wanted to talk about trauma because the principle I want to give you today is the trauma doesn't have to be emotional to start with. So you can have a physical trauma, you can have a chemical trauma, you can have you can have an emotional trauma. You can have all of these different traumas and they they kind of get stuck in the body. So let's look at, for example, a nutritional deficiency or being exposed to a certain type of toxin. So you can be exposed to, let's say, mercury or mold or a mycotoxin. And this is a traumatic experience for the body. And the thing about the body is it responds to trauma. It responds to stress in the same way regardless of what the trauma or so basically trauma it's a trauma is such like a it has a lot of weight behind the word but we can often kind of not really realize what trauma actually is trauma is basically just a very acute stress so it's just something that happens that is very stressful and it happens very fast and it isn't resolved that's what really makes it a trauma so it's like you open a stress loop you create a situation where the body is in a stressed state, where the body enters a state of distress, and it's not able to de-escalate. It's not able to move itself out of that stress loop, and you get stuck in it. And that's that's what, what causes lots of different types of trauma-related chronic illness, because the body is stuck in this open trauma loop. So this can happen for emotional traumas. So this can be a sexual assault, this can be not feeling love, this can be a million different things. You know, this can be anything that causes an emotional trauma. But this can be physical things as well. If you have a chronic nutritional deficiency for an extended period of time, that is a traumatic experience for the body. And it will develop a trauma response. And a nutritional deficiency is going to be accompanied by a certain emotional state. Because obviously your body doesn't have the ingredients that it needs to function to keep you alive. So that's going to, your body's going to give you biofeedback and say, we don't feel very good, you know, and we probably feel quite depressed and we feel really sad or we feel really lethargic all the time. And, and this is a trauma. And now you've associated, your body has on a, like a subconscious or somatic level has associated nutritional deficiency with this emotional trauma, this, this traumatic emotional state. So, the trauma itself doesn't have to start as an emotional trauma. You can have a nutritional deficiency. You can be exposed to a toxin. So I'll, I'm going to use mold because mold is a really good example. And the reason it's a really good, good example is it's very, you can, even once you get through the healing process, even once you desensitize yourself, even when you move out of a, the moldy building or you remediate and you, you get your exposure down, it's very easy to be re-exposed because you can just walk into any random store. You can go to, you can almost go anywhere and there's a statistical, a, quite a statistically high chance you're going to get exposed to mold or mycotoxins of, of some kind, just because it just happens, you know, when it's, it's simple maths, wherever you've got dead material and water, you're going to, you're going to get mold. And as time goes on, as buildings get older, the, the chance of the likelihood that they're going to be exposed to some kind of water damage just increases over time. So you can walk into, you can, you can, you can be at home when you're not exposed, you're completely fine. So we're looking kind of like chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Maybe this could be a mast cell attack or an anaphylaxis or some kind of acute immune stimulation. And this is physical, you know, this is a, this is a, a physical, a physiological response to trauma. So your body is exposed to this molecule, this mycotoxin, that it has associated as being extremely dangerous because it, it perpetuated a, a state of chronic ill health in the past. And it's exposed to this molecule and it, and it triggers this same cascade that it triggered the first time or the time previously when it was exposed. So... In this case, you can be completely healed, you know, you can be completely symptom free as long as you aren't exposed, but then you can expose yourself and immediately like click of your fingers, you're getting the same level of immune response that you got when you were, ex when you were exposed previously when you were really ill. And this is because the body has, as it's, it's traumatized on a physical level. The body now associates this small level of danger. So if you walk in, if you walk through a hallway and there's mold there, it's not really that dangerous. You know, your body is resilient. Your body is strong. Like I can do this myself. You know, I can go into a building that has mold in and I've, I can feel it. And it's like, I don't really want to be in here. I don't feel very good, but I'm okay. You know, my body does, it has an appropriate level 
of immune of immune response and you want your body to respond because you're being exposed to something that's toxic so it's, it's killing you you want an immune response you don't want to turn that off but you need it to be calibrated to the level of exposure you're actually experiencing whereas what happens is the body remembers how it responded in the past so it's exposed to a very small amount you know a very a very minute exposure and instead of responding in a very small way, in a calibrated, healthy response, it just goes ballistic and it throws the entire immune function at this very insignificant toxin exposure. And this, this is, this is a trauma. This is a, this is a trauma response. Think about, so if you extrapolate what I'm saying here and you apply it to where trauma is more sort of like conventionally considered with like an emotional trauma, it's like you have a small event that triggers an emotional state that you're holding. So this is that trauma loop that we were talking about. So you've got this emotional trauma loop that's still open, and then you throw that whole emotional response that you were holding from that trauma in the past at the current present situation, even though it's completely, like, it's not it's not a calibrated response. We're bringing from the past and throwing it on the current situation. And this happens on a physical level as well. And if this happens over and over and over and over again, I absolutely guarantee you, you develop some kind of emotional attachment to this to this response. So this is why when people are exposed to, so say they, they're out of mold and then they get exposed to mycotoxins again, the, the, the really common response is they feel rage, they feel lots of anger, they feel, some people feel like like really weary and sad and they just become like maybe suicidally depressed. It's usually one of these two. It's like really like this explosive rage, like can't contain it, just completely no reasonable level of like right, like just completely flying loose. Like you just just rage, just pure rage or this like suicidal level depression. And this is because on a physical level, the body is being poisoned and it, it doesn't like that. So if you're in touch with your rage, your body's like, I'm dying here. I need to fight to survive. So it triggers the emotion of rage. But if you don't have access to that, it will go more into the, the fear base, like, okay, I'm, I'm basically dying, I'm really sad, I'm dying, so I'm, I feel depressed. And you, you attach this emotional state to this physiological response. So the trauma itself doesn't have to originally be emotional. It can start as a physiological response. But then obviously, if things are happening in your life, you're going to feel a certain way about them. You're going to like them, you're going to dislike them, you're going to feel different emotions to these, to these things. And our emotions are, are also really, really good clues as to like what, what we're doing in our life and as to whether if this is something we want to keep doing or if we want to change something. So if this is if this is happening, the body is triggering this response physically, the body is saying we don't want to be in this state where we have to throw our whole immune system at this source of toxicity all of the time. So it makes you feel bad. And then we, we, we connect this emotional side and wherever there's an emotion, there's a thought. So a thought will always follow an emotion. Whenever you feel an emotion, you will think something as well. Sometimes we're able to detach this and this is why doing, being, being mindful through this process can be really helpful because we can start to break this, break this coupling apart. But usually you have, you experience an emotion and then you move into a thought pattern and this thought pattern and this emotion will also be connected to some kind of physiological response inside the body. But any of these things can trigger it. So you can have the, so these are all connected. This is, this is next level holistic approach. This is the, this is where holistic medicine and holistic healing is going is to understand that you cannot have dysfunction on any one of those levels without having dysfunction on every single level at the same time. So if you have a physical health problem, you also have a mental and an emotional health problem. They are all intrinsically connected. One level of response on one level triggers a response on all of these other levels because your body is holistic. So you have an emotional trauma, so you experience a rage or you get triggered or something like that. It will trigger a mental thought pattern process and it will trigger a physiological response. And in the inverse, if you experience the physiological response, so you're exposed to the mycotoxin or whatever chemical it was that triggered you or whatever it is physically. This can even be foods, even healthy foods. So if we if we get our wires crossed in our brain and we have a part a part of us inside that now perceives certain foods or certain like additives in supplements. So for me, one of the big ones was fiber. Anything that had fiber in it, my body immediately determined like this is this is death. You know, this is the most dangerous substance known to man. And as soon as I had a small bit of fiber inside my body, my body would just go App, it would throw everything at it, you know, TH1 immune response, TH2 immune response, trigger everything, all the inflammatory molecules, just, just throw everything at it. You know, this is life or death. 
and it, and that wasn't appropriate. That wasn't a calibrated response. Laura Sylvester Fox says this makes a lot of sense. The body keeps the score. That's a, that's a really good book if you want to learn more about this. The body keeps the score is a really good book. It's all it's all about this. That's looking more at the the I would say the somatic the and the emotional side. But what I'm trying to do here is get more people into this into this world because not everybody's into like emotions and spirituality, but everybody's like, okay, well, I get exposed to something and I feel bad. It's like, th that is trauma. That is trauma that needs to be worked on. Because if you don't work on that, if you don't, if you don't work on uncoup uncoupling the exposure to the response, every time you're exposed, you will respond in the same way. But this is something you can work on. This is something you can deescalate. You can change your body's level of physiological response. You can change your, your, your thought process. You can change your emotional response. These are things you can work on. These are not set in stone. You can change these things. Uh, it might take some time. It might take some, some work, you know. Healing trauma is, is a tricky process, you know, because to, to heal the trauma, you, you're going into really elevated and physiologically and emotionally aroused states. And that's where you're really volatile and very vulnerable. And that's, that can be dangerous for for you to to do that so you have to feel really safe to go into these places you have to be it's really hard to do these things by yourself at least initially um and it's going to can also be really hard to see these things yourself because the obviously your body is trying to keep you safe so it doesn't want you to see the things that are, that, are, that are triggering these loops that have kept you safe in the past it doesn't want you to become aware of them because as far as it's concerned it's better if you don't know because it's trying to keep you alive and it kept you alive in the past so it's going to keep trying to do this to try to keep you alive so it can be really hard to become aware of these things or perceive these things ourselves. And it can be really nice to get a, an external look. This could be like a therapist, coach, something like that. Just even even friends and family, you know. Anytime you get triggered, you're like, if you can go to the to the person and say, like, okay, I'm triggered. What is what is going on here? Help me help me through this. It can be very hard to do. It can be very hard to hold yourself as aware as that in a in a triggered state. But if you can, if you, if you've got good people around you, if you've got aware people that actually are trying to help you grow and help you become a better version of yourself, you can talk with them about these things and they can help you through it. But if you've got strong physiological responses, if you've got um, like deep triggers where you're feeling pulled into like very deep emotional states, if you're getting physio physiological responses that are extremely disproportionate, and they're actually really negatively affecting your life. It's definitely better if you get somebody to help you with this because it, it it's there's so much there's so much energy here, you know. There's so much like physiological immune response. There's so much emotional energy. There's so much happening, and it can be you, the reason that it's traumatic for you is you already don't have containment for this yourself. So if you don't have containment for the experiences that happened to you in the past you're not going to have the tools in your toolbox. You're not going to have the resources that you'd need to be able to hold space, not only to hold space for these, these emotionally or physiologically life or death. So your body, even if you're in a safe environment, your body perceives these as being a life or death levels of energy being mobilized. You're not going to be able to hold space for that and to be aware, to walk you yourself through the process as you're in a state like that. So it can be really helpful to have somebody that is that understands these kind of things, preferably to have some, an increased level of capacity for the exact things that you're working on. So if you know it's associated with rage, work with somebody that you know has been through the thing with rage and has worked on this. If this is somebody that you know has had, a, so say for example, you have a strong physiological response, you know, exposed to something, triggers a strong physiological response inside the body. You want to be working with somebody that has been through that as well, because they're going to have some level of understanding as to what is actually happening inside you and they're going to have some level of understanding as to how to hold the space for that as it's coming out so when when you're in when you're going basically when you're in trauma healing you're 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 kind of like immersed in the moment you're very it's very hard to stay to stay present with everything that's happening all at the same time. That's why it was traumatic in the first place. So when we're uncovering it, you can't hold space for everything that's happening and walk yourself through it at the same time. This is why it can be really helpful to have somebody, even if they're just listening to you as you walk through it, so they can help to sort of guide you through and provide support and, and not being alone. You know, that's a huge one. In nature, animals, when they're checked, so again, this is a physiological response. So this, I, so I'm, I'm really trying to open your open your mind to this this trauma of not just being an emotional thing, it's a physiological thing as well. 
So in nature, say the the gazelle, I don't know what they are, those those things that run around in Africa, you know, the gazelles, the antelope, whatever whatever they're called. Say it gets chased by a cheetah. It will not go through a somatic discharge of its stress if it is alone because it doesn't feel safe and it's not safe for it to go into a very vulnerable state like that by itself. It will only do that when it's in the middle of the herd. It will go into the middle of the herd. All of the other animals will stand around it and protect it and keep it safe. And it basically goes on the floor and has this like massive somatic discharge. So it's like wiggling and convulsing on the floor. And this is it processing through this physiologically traumatic event. So I'm sure you know, animals, they don't have as as broad array of emotions as, as we do as humans. That obviously they still do. Like, you know, when your dog's happy, you know, when your dog's sad, you know, when he's excited, you know, when he's depressed, like, you, you know, these things, but the capacity is way smaller. The emotions have a, like a, a, a quieter volume, but this is happening to the, to the animal, to the, to the gazelle, to the deer. It's on a physiological level. It has, it has these stress hormones in its body and it needs to process through them. But it has emotions that are associated with them as well. And I guarantee you, if you take a gazelle, you let a, ch let a cheetah ta chase after it, traumatize it, and then take it out of that environment and leave it by itself and never give it the opportunity to discharge all of that, that stress, that, that, ner that, that elevated nervous system state. If you never give it the opportunity to get, to, to process through that, it will exhibit behaviors of depression, of, emotional dysregulation and it will develop a chronic illness that is just how it works so as humans we're even more susceptible to this because our emotional the depth that we can feel emotions is so much bigger than than animals so you have to see that trauma is not just this emotional thing you know there's always an emotional component attached to it because physiological stress is emotionally can be emotionally traumatic and this is this is really when trauma occurs is when we have so many things that are happening all at the same time and we can't process it all so that's 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 what trauma healing is about is create so it's it's twofold so first of all it's creating space so that we can process through any trauma that has accumulated in the body physically as an immune response or as stress hormones etc emotionally as emotions that we didn't process so emotions are kind of like guidance from from a part of us that is intangible that is trying to communicate something with us so we need to figure out what that message is but secondly and perhaps even more importantly the first i would say would happen quite naturally if you're at home with a partner that is aware and and you have a safe space but the the, the real problem with trauma is and this is the second part. We don't know how to do this. We don't have the tools. We don't have the the know-how. So, like the the deer, the gazelle, for example, it goes into the into the middle of the group, and it just has its like it, it just has that that release, that discharge. It knows how to do that, and then it's done. And that's that's fine because it's just it's just physiological. It's just a physiological response. The animal knows how to do it because it's it's an instinct. This is so. This is a this is the thing about about trauma is. We all get, everyone gets traumatized. There's not a single person on earth that doesn't have trauma. But when we have the correct tools to be able to process through the trauma, the body knows how to heal itself automatically. The, tr the body knows how to process trauma automatically. It already has these tools. The reason that we really get stuck as humans is either we don't learn these things because our, our brains are significantly bigger. If you look at how dependent we are on our parents for survival compared to like, so we always using the deers and the gazelle for an example. A gazelle, a baby gazelle pops out of its mum, 24 hours later it can run away from a cheetah. Look at a one-year-old baby, you know, say a cheetah comes after a one-year-old baby, it's just this snack that's laying there, you know, it can't do anything, its head is so big, it can't even, it can't even sit up, you know. So we're so dependent and we need to learn we, we, we learn more through the relationship with our parents and through that developmental stage than we, than we do through instinct. We, we don't have as much when we're first born and then we go through a period of development when we're young. But that development period is really important because while these animals, they get these things as instinct, they have these resources, they have these tools, they're basically born with them. We are not. And we are taught them by how our parents learn how to regulate and express their emotions, how they process stress. And if they don't have these tools, if they don't have these resources, if they don't know how to do this, they cannot teach you. 
Because you cannot teach someone how to do something that you don't know how to do yourself. So it's not that your parents are doing anything wrong. It's not that they like hate you and that there's something wrong with you. It's that they can't teach you to do something that they don't know how to do. And if their parents didn't know how to do it, they couldn't teach them either. So this is the second part of trauma. And this is where most people are actually getting stuck. It's not that they don't have space. It's not that they don't have the intention. It's that they don't know that they... They, for some reason, they haven't developed this ability to process trauma. There's, on, on a physiological level, yes, we do have that, that physical somatic, that, that wiggling, that um, tremoring. We have that. But our emotions can get in the way and we can hold ourselves and we can say, like, that's weird. I shouldn't, I shouldn't tremor like that. That's strange. Uh, and you can, our, our minds, just as powerful as they are, they can be just as powerful against us and they can, they can say like, it's not safe to do this, or it's weird, I shouldn't do that. Or we can, when we get disconnected from this, this instinctive level, this somatic like intelligence that our body has, we can over intellectualize and think ourselves out of the solution. And the solu on, on many levels, so on the physical level at least, the solution is really simple because the body already knows how to do it. It's, it's intrinsic, the body is, the, the baby is born with this. But when it comes to the emotional trauma, it's slightly different because we learn about emotions, we learn how to process, we know how to regulate, we, we learn these things in early childhood. So if our parents didn't know how to do it, they can't teach us how to do it. And if we do something that puts us in an emotional state that they can't, that they don't know how to regulate, that is triggering for them. That's a traumatic experience for them. If they can't, if, so again, they can't process that trauma. So they're, they're, they're now getting, they're now in a hyper aroused state. That is not a safe parent. Safe parents are, they're, they're able to regulate their immune, their, their emotional state. If they become triggered, if they become hyper aroused in a, in a, in an elevated state of emotion, they project all of that onto the child. And then the child fragments. They, they, not only do they split that part off from themselves. So if it's like a three year old boy having a, a tantrum and the father elevates into, aggression the child doesn't learn how to regulate his own aggression he doesn't learn how to how to integrate that part of himself and he rejects it and this is this was really what happened in in, in my case when you when you're disconnected from your rage you develop fatigue you will develop a, a fatigue a chronic fatigue kind of expression because the rage is the seat of your personal power. It's where you get all of your vitality. It's, where, it's that solar plexus energy in the in the middle of your belly. So if if you're watching this and you have a, a health condition or you have symptoms that you feel in the solar plexus area in your body, so this is below the bottom of your breast blo the breastbone and above the belly button, so that that kind of upper digestive area where your stomach and the and the upper part of your intestines are, this is the seat of your rage. This is the seat of your personal power. And if it wasn't safe for you to express this when you were younger, you, first of all, your parents would just cut you off. They would stop you being able to express that. You wouldn't be able to experience that that raw level of empowerment. But that's that's just the first part. That's where it goes wrong. So this is where we we fragment and we we lose that part of ourselves. But the and, and that's really damaging. That in itself is really damaging. But what is worse is we're now missing a part of ourselves. We're now missing a part of our emotional toolbox. This is this is a part of us as a whole. So we're fragmented. We're not whole anymore. And we're only powerful when we're whole. We're only our strongest version. We're only our best selves. We're only our authentic selves when we're whole, when we have access to all of our emotional toolbox. I'm using anger here as an example. This can be anything. This can be sadness. This can even be positive emotions, like generosity. I had a lot of trauma around generosity. I was always told I was quite selfish. So to realize I'm actually a generous person, I was like, wow, that was, that's quite traumatic. <laughs> so with, uh, with, with, the, with, the rage, with the rage component, it's not only do you lose that part of yourself, but you, you don't get the opportunity to practice when you're young. So, this, so as we were saying, you, you're not born with this. You need those first, it's mostly the first seven years to learn how to experience, process, interact with and engage with and regulate your own emotion. So if you're denied this experience, so if, so we'll use the, the anger for example, you have a tantrum, your parents have a, a small emotional capacity for anger, for rage, 
they don't know what to do with you, so they just get angry at you. So basically, but even when we're fragmented, we're still whole. So we just, we just, it's an illusion that we pretend that we're not, we don't have rage. We pretend we don't have self confidence, and it's it somaticizes it. It's it's there. We just pretend it isn't. So this parent is now angry, even though they say they don't have access to rage and they don't know how to access that anger and everything. They they will be angry at the child. So they're using that emotion that they have themselves, but in a, in a subconscious way, you know, because they're triggered, they're in an, an emotional state. They get angry at the child. They shout at the kid for being angry. And that doesn't help the kid. You know, the, the, the child is trying to experience a state of, of, of heightened emotional arousal. And what they need at that time is safety and presence and guidance to know what to do with that emotion so they can integrate it and use it in a healthy way. So just as rage can be the emotion that makes people murder people or rape people or do horrible things, it's also the energy that makes you feel empowered, that makes you feel confident, that makes you go into the world and say, I'm fucking awesome. You know, I deserve to have a great life. So if you're out of touch with it on one front, you're out of touch with it on all fronts. And if you are not given the opportunity to practice this emotion, anytime you experience anger, in your life, it is traumatic because you haven't practiced it. You don't know how to use it. You don't know how to communicate with it. You don't know what the emotion is. You don't know what to do with it. it it's traumatic. Even if it's a small thing, you know, you get a parking ticket, you go ballistic. You, someone, someone does something that is just a really small level of inconvenience and it just, you just fly into a rage about it because even that small amount of emotion exceeds your capacity because you never had the opportunity to practice that emotion. So we need to, first of all, provide the space for the body to go through and allow it to process these things. But we also need to work on providing the body with the tools that it needs to be able to process through the experience. So this is really like, this is basics, you know. What you're doing here is you're, you're, you're learning how to interact with your emotions like a seven-year-old does or like a six-year-old or even a two or three-year-old, you know. So this is really... This is this work is all in the feminine. This work really is in the feminine because think about childcare. It's a really a feminine. It's really a feminine thing, and I don't mean that only women can do it. When I say feminine, that is not what I mean. What I mean is it's this nurturing, motherly, even fatherly, in that caring realm is feminine energy. So it's this like understanding, relational, compassionate connection energy that is. That is femininity. That's what's happening there. So that's where the work is. It's developing that inside the individual so they can learn how to experience that emotion again. And what, what usually happens is we trigger, so tying it back, so looping it back around and going back to the physical again. So we have a physical exposure. We are exposed to something that triggers a physiological level of trauma in the body. We trigger the immune response, we trigger stress hormones because the body was exposed to something that was really dangerous in the past and it's responding with the same level of response as to when it was really dangerous as to now even when it's only a really tiny amount. So that happens on a physiological level. This is the, the immune system. Think of the, the, the immune system like a little baby. This is the immune system, the little baby, having a tantrum. It's raging, it's angry, it's, ah, I don't know what to do with this. This is dangerous, this is scary, this is, this is not okay. And... We don't, and, and if we don't know how to handle anger and rage and the emotions that, that that part of ourselves is experiencing, then we don't know what to do with it. We feel lost. We feel despair. We feel angry. We feel, we're like, I've been exposed to mold again. Ah, oh, I'm angry about it. Because that part of you that is feeling unsafe, you don't know how to sit with it and help it process what it's experiencing and make it feel safe and reassure it again. And this can't just be superficial, you know? If a kid bangs his head and he runs up to you and he's crying and you just, oh, you're okay, but the kid knows he's not okay, not only do you not resolve the trauma, you actually traumatize him more because that's a form of gaslighting. You're telling him you're okay when he's actually not. So if your immune system is flying off the handle because of of a it's being exposed to a small amount of something that was really dangerous to it in the past. And you're just like, oh, you're okay. You just stroke it. And you're, like, you're fine. You're okay. But it knows that it isn't, or it believes that it isn't. That isn't helping. That's actually creating more fragmentation. So we really have to, this is the first part of the trauma healing is, is validation is making that part of you understand 
it's really okay for you to feel like that. I can totally understand why you do. And then it will communicate with us and it will say, this is what's happening. Like, I need this, I need that. And then we take care of it. And then when we give it what it needs, it feels taken care of. And the trauma loop can close. And on a physiological level, this means that next time the body is exposed to the thing, and this is this is the thing, it's uh, desensitization. So you do this one time, and it doesn't mean the next time the response won't happen. But it will happen to a to a lesser degree. And then we have to do the same thing, you know? But what we did to soothe it the last time might not work this time because we don't know what the part needs. That time it might have felt afraid. Now it may feel injustice and it may feel like it wants revenge or something, you know? And we have to talk with it. We, And this is why it can be tricky because it requires internal dialogue. It requires internal communication. And if you don't have that and and if you didn't get the opportunity to practice this when you were younger, then well, you're going to have absolutely no how, no idea how to do this. This can be a really hard process because you're going to feel like you're guessing a lot of the time. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't, and you're just left clueless. And this is because there's the communication isn't deep. The communication isn't the communication isn't synced, and it's not streamlined, and it's not effective to the point where you're able to derive the need of the part of whatever it is that is causing the reaction and meet the need. If the part is having the tantrum, you stay with it, you allow it to go through the process. As it requests support, you provide it the support that it needs. The trauma loop comes to an end by itself. This is what I'm saying. The body the body knows how to do these things. You know, It comes to a completion by itself. If you stay with a toddler while he's having a meltdown and you actually sit with him through the process, he doesn't stay in a tantrum forever. You know, it... It's an extremely, extremely high state of arousal. The body cannot cannot sustain a state like that indefinitely. So it comes to a point naturally of closure. And the same happens physiologically as well. And if it doesn't, that is where you have chronic disease. So this kind of went longer than I'd, than I'd anticipated. But I think it's it's really important to understand that trauma doesn't have to start emotionally. It can start as a physiological thing. It can start as an exposure. It can start as a toxin exposure. It can start as a physical trauma. You know, you can injure yourself. I I was recently, so I've had a persistent knee and ankle problem. And I was I was working on this and communicating with these parts myself and, and working with people and getting the help that I need. And I became aware. That's quite funny. Getting the help that I that I need for my for my knee. So I became aware that this was from a, a bike accident that I had when I was a little kid, like 12 years old. And I fell off my bike and I was so far. So I had the physical level of trauma, which which was enough to be traumatic. But then I was also really far away from my house. I didn't know how I was going to get home. So I felt despair. I felt like I was going to die. I, like, and I know it sounds funny. Like you fell off your bike, you feel like you're going to die. But it's like this is what happens when you're in a traumatic state. Your, your space is your capacity is really small and everything is really it feels really big in contrast. And. It was that, and it was like, how am I going to get home? And I was being silly, so I was like, if I tell my dad, I'm going to be in trouble. And I hit somebody's car when I fell, and I'm like, if they come out, they're going to shout at me. And it's like this whole big mess of, and it was it was trauma, you know. And I stored that in my knee, and now I'm working on that, and I'm resolving that as a process. And as I do, and I work on this emotional stuff, and I work on the physiological side, it's going to work to actually heal the problem. Chris says, I've had neck pain for the past few years and it has led to so much trauma. Neck pain is a really interesting one. Neck pain is also one of the ones that I've struggled with with the most. Metaphysically, the neck is really connected to control. And we we seek for control when we feel out of control. And nothing is going to make you feel out of control like a chronic illness. So <laughs> so I've, I've been there. I, 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 I really get you. I really understand what you're saying. There's a... One final note before I finish up today. So first of all, if anyone has questions, I know I've got, I've got 10 of you on here, so I, I see you all. I, I, love, I love that you're all here. Uh, if you have any questions, let me, let me know your questions just before I finish. But I want to cover one more thing while I, while I wait for you to ask. Well, I was going to, but it just seems to have <laughs> slipped out of my head. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just get straight onto the questions. Chris says, do you think trauma can be released with balancing the energy centers? I feel like that, like, yeah, I would say yes, but I feel like that's quite a, that's a, 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 a very logical way of looking at a very 
So it's a very masculine way of looking at a very feminine thing. So I find that most of trauma healing is, is, is completely illogical. It doesn't make logical sense. It, I would say it's true. We do have energy centers. They do need to be balanced, but I feel like going at it with this intention is maybe a bit like, I feel like with trauma healing, it's not about imposing direction. It's about, it's generally the complete opposite. It's creating space, directionless space for the body to process whatever it needs to process. So I find going in with intention usually doesn't actually help that much because the body is so much smarter than we are. The body knows what trauma needs to be healed next. The body knows what it has space and capacity for. The body is so much smarter on every single level in every single way than the, the, the like the mind, the ego identity that we have. I mean, just think, I mean, it, it sounds silly to say it, maybe to some, but think about what your body is doing on a daily basis compared to what you're doing on a daily basis. You're like, I get up, I'm going to figure out what to eat. I'm going to go and put some clothes on. I'm going to do this. Literally every second of every day, your body's doing like a million bazillion trillion different functions. You know, it's doing stomach acid. It's doing nutrient uptake. It's doing cellular re renewal inside every cell. You've got mitochondria that are being regenerated and my mitochondria are producing energy. You've got immune system. You've got immune function. You've got sensory data coming in. That's like, you don't think you can't even think about how complex it is to take the wave frequencies of the environment around you to come into your eye, to be processed in your brain into an image that you can perceive, into sensory input that is actually usable. The amount of processing that goes into a process like that, that we see as simple, you know, it's open eyes, see stuff. The amount of effort or work that goes into that on a somatic, on a, on a, on a body level is absolutely unfathomable. You know, you could never consciously do that you could never consciously orchestrate that process of material externally to inside the eye into a, an image inside the brain that can actually be usable input. And that's just one example. You've got smell, you've got taste, you've got, you've got hearing, you've got touch on your whole nervous system on your body. Your body's doing all of this while it's doing immune function. It's doing mucosal immune function. It's regulating your blood pressure. It's producing cholesterol in your liver. It's detoxing it's doing everything all at the same time your body is so much smarter than you so let the body do the hard work because it's so much better at it than we are i have one more question here so ceci says does does the rife machine address emotional and spiritual issues um it can yes so so leaning back on something that i that I mentioned just a minute ago is the next level of holistic practitioners are going to be able to understand that you cannot have disease or dysfunction on one level of the body and not have it on all of the other levels of the body simultaneously. So if you have a chemical exposure, if you have a toxin, if you have a parasite, if you, has a, if you have a physical ailment, this is connected to a thought process. This is connected to something that is happening inside your mind. You think a certain way about the physical symptom. When I say it like this, it seems obvious, but so this shows you there's a mental level of connection here as well. When you think about these things, so when you think about the physical health problem, it puts you in a certain emotional state. These things are all connected. So sometimes the physical manifestation isn't actually where the intervention needs to be made. It's the emotional. So, so for example, the, my leg problem, right? What do I think about it? I'm like, so my, so I'm going to walk you through this. I'm going to do this like live of me doing it right now. So foot problem. I feel frustrated. I feel irritated. I feel annoyed. I feel powerless. I feel like I can't be independent because I can't even walk. I can't walk anywhere. And it's like, you can't do anything if you can't walk. You know, you're so dependent on others. And the, my thought process with this is like, something's wrong with me. I'm doing something wrong. I need to change something. There's something that I don't know. All of these are disease. So the physical problem, the emotion that I connect to it and the thought process that goes along with it as well is they're all the same thing. They're just manifesting on different levels of frequency. So the physical is the most dense. The mental is a level higher than that. And the emotional is a layer even higher than that. So the physical is physically in the world. So it's, it's dense. The mental is is less dense, but not so de not so 
um, etheric as emotion because we can kind of understand our thought process. You know, our thoughts kind of make sense to us because they're more they're more th th that they're, they're more th three dimensional than than our emotions and our emotions a lot of the time don't make much sense to us at all because they're a higher level of frequency they're they're a higher level of information they're a higher level of insight but a dysfunction on one of these levels indicates a dysfunction on every single level you cannot have one and not have one on the other levels as well because this is what holistic means so one level of holistic is looking at like the liver is connected to the pancreas is connected to the skin is connected to the gut but to take that to the next level the physiological dysfunction inside the body, the physiological, like the physical disease, the gut, the, the digestive discomfort, the bloating, the gas, the heartburn, the reflux, the fatigue is connected to a thought process. You think about it a certain way and you that makes you feel a certain way as well. All of these are disease. It's not just the physical thing. It's the whole process. So we have to deconstruct all of these things on all levels, physically, emotionally and mentally. And that's where we're going to find the solution to these problems. So tying that more directly back into the question, does the Rife machine address emotional and spiritual issues? Yes, because when you work on the physical thing, so say you work on killing a parasite, it's going to make you feel a certain way. So if, for example, I work on killing parasites too quickly, I will feel extreme levels of, so I feel the stomach pain. So there's the physical symptom. I feel depressed. I feel really low energy. So there's the emotion that's alongside that. And to be honest, I don't even, I'm not even aware of the thought process yet. So I have work to do that. But they're all connected. So if you work on, so right now I'm doing an 11 day bioresonance detox. Different people are going to be experiencing different things. They're going to feel physically bad and they're going to think a certain way about that. And they're going to emotionally feel a certain way about that as well. And if the, what I find usually happens is, so ev everything is entangled. So certain molecules, so certain toxins are connected to certain emotions, to certain thought processes. So one that I can tell you that I'm aware of, that I became aware of through myself and I've observed a lot is mycotoxins. So mold and mycotoxins are very much connected to victimhood and disempowerment. So this is why most people that are exposed to this, they develop a SIBO kind of situation. They've got this problem in the upper digestive system, in this solar plexus region of the body. They're all, it's all connected. So this physical toxin, the mycotoxin and the mold physical organism itself is connected to the emotional state of disempowerment and victimhood. And what do people that are victims or that are in an emotional state of disempowerment say? I can't afford it. I can't do this. Oh, woe me, everything's, everything sucks. Like, why is this happening to me? You know, that you can go on Google and type, like, what does a victim say? You can even go in a step further if you want to look at this in the, in the realms of the mind. And you can try to look at the archetypes. So you can look at Carl Jung's work here. Or there's, there's lots of work on, on archetypes. And you can look at the archetype of the victim and see what the victim says. And if you read the archetype of the victim, I bet you, you go and find somebody that's exposed to mold and has mold illness. And read off this list of things that the victim archetype says, they'll be matching one for one because this thought process, this, this mindset state is connected to the physiological mycotoxin, which is connected to the emotional state of victimhood and disempowerment. This is one thing I'm really aware of because I see this, this, this myself in, in myself and I've seen it in a lot of other people as well. And if you want to heal from mold illness, you can't just detox. You have to work on the disempowerment energy. You have to work on the thought process that goes behind it. You have to work on all three of these levels. Otherwise, the body won't even release the mycotoxin, which is which is really interesting. So I hope that answers your I hope that answers your question. So just to just to make sure that it really does. Does the Rife machine address emotional and spiritual issues? Yes. When you target physiological things like mold, mycotoxins, metals, parasites, it will trigger emotional things. But the Rife machine itself is working on a frequency level. So if the root cause of being exposed to a certain parasite, so let's say like, so generally any parasite, Lyme, EBV, for example, they're going to be directly connected to having poor boundaries. If you have strong boundaries, you are, you're basically impenetrable to parasites. Parasites cannot live in an environment where strong boundaries are being, are being made, that they're, they're not a vibrational match. 
Because what is a parasite? A parasite is something that is taking without the host's permission. And if you have parasites, you're doing, you have the same dynamic happening in your life with your other relationships with other people. So that other people are being emotional or mental or financial parasites on you. And you're seeing that reflected inside the body. So you can, you can use the machine to target the physiological thing, but you, if that's not where the root cause is, and you know the root cause is, is more emotional or is more a mental process, you can work using things like bark flower remedies. So you can, I don't know if you know about what, what bark flowers are, bark flowers, B-A-C-H. They're, they're different flowers that have different resonant frequencies that are connected to different emotions. So you can apply these frequencies directly using the machine instead of using the flower essence itself. Different emotions have different frequencies, so you can apply these to your body. So you can apply, say for example, joy to your body, or like elation, ecstasy, bliss, these, these positive emotions. And if, you're an emo and if you are a vibrational match to these things, you will just feel that way. But if you're not, the machine will help you see where you're, where you're in contrast to this. So if you apply frequencies of joy, and you're full of, you feel full of grief and sadness... Your lungs will probably get all mucusy. You'll be coughing. You'll you'll just feel really emotional, and your and the machine is helping you to become aware of where the the blockage is from stopping you feel the frequency that you are sending to yourself from the machine. So you can go about it in a roundabout way. I would say anything that's working physically is working mentally, emotionally, and spiritually as well. But you can actually directly address it with the Rife machine as well. Yes. Okay, so we've got we've got one more here. So let me know if you have questions. Wrapping up in just a sec. Or maybe not a question, it's a statement. Chris says, having mold illness has literally changed my beliefs on this world. It's crazy how much mold has tried to change my personality in a negative way. Yeah, so it's really connected to this, to that, to that, to that energy that I was that I was mentioning earlier. Look for these parts of your psyche that are unintegrated and work on integrating them. And I guarantee you, as you do, these things will begin to change. These things will begin to shift. There's a metaphysical connection to everything. There's not a, a single random thing that happens. You don't get a single random symptom. The events that are happening in your life, they're not random. They're all perfectly connected in some unfathom, like just in the same way that your body is functioning. You know, I was talking about how it, how much process goes into your eye being able to see and your gut being able to digest and all of this stuff that's happening in your body. It's not random. It's very finely calculated. The same thing is happening in the whole rest of the universe. Your symptoms are not random. They're very specific. If you want to learn more about them, go on Google and type the symptom followed by the word metaphysics or metaphysical interpretation. And you will learn so much. When I have a problem now, my, my gut instinct is go and look for the metaphysics, not for the, for the physical reality of it. Because the metaphysics are where the real answers are. You, you don't have random things happening to your body. You don't have random things happening in your life. Everything has significance and meaning. And when you begin to perceive that, and when you begin to become aware of that, you can start piecing things together and stuff really starts to make way more sense. And you, you have answers, you know? And sure, you're not going to understand it all. I, I, I really, I really think this is like, I have a almost unhealthy obsession with, with understanding how the universe actually works. And I dedicate probably way more time than is healthy to trying to figure these things out. But that, that's why I'm, I'm good at, at what I do. So there are links to everything. And, and I'd spend so much time doing this. And I still have absolutely no idea. You know, metaphysics is such a broad, a broad subject with such individual personalized interpretations. It's, it's a thing, you know, it's, it's a whole, it's a whole thing that is so insurmountable. You will never understand it all. But even if you can start to glimpse it just a little bit, you'll get so many answers to so many questions that you didn't know were possible to have answers for. Sassy says, uh, thanks for all the questions, uh, by the way, Sassy. She says, if you're in a sympathetic state, fight or flight, can we use a Rife machine to heal physical issues? Some people are extremely sick and cannot tolerate those treatments. I'm wondering why, why is that? So it depends on the level of intolerance. So something that I find really interesting is people that, so I'm, I'm going to give you two examples here. So with, with two different, two different types of probiotics with lactobacillus and bifidobacterium strains of bacteria, these are metaphysically connected to certain emotional states. So lactobacillus is connected to personal power, empowerment, 
that, that anger, rage, energy that I was talking about earlier, boundaries, self-confidence, all of that. And bifidobacterium is connected to love and being able to give and receive unconditionally. Or at the lower levels, conditionally, but on the higher levels, unconditionally. So I've seen intolerance to these kinds of treatments. So intolerance to lactobacillus or to bifidobacterium species because emotionally, the host is not a vibrational match to giving and receiving unconditionally. The, the host is not a compatible match to the vibrational frequency of strong boundaries, of self-confidence, of assertiveness. And when the organism comes into the body, it tries to bring the awareness to the host. Look, this is how you're not a vibrational match to me. And I represent empowerment. I represent love. And you are not love. You are not empowerment. And this is how. And that's where the symptom comes. This is what triggers the symptom. So this is the problem on this in this situation is not a physical problem. It's an emotional problem, but we're working through this three level system of the, I mean, it's technically a four level system. I would say it's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. We're working on that physical, that physical level to get insight on the mental and emotional, because I bet you these take, this happened to me, you know, so you take the probiotic and it triggers a certain thought process and it triggers a physical state inside the body and it triggers an emotional, an emotional situation. It triggers you to be in a certain emotional state. And it's showing you where the wound is. So you can go and fix that. And that's the organism trying to help you. So whilst you're intolerant and you can't tolerate the, the therapy, it doesn't mean it's not working. It's bringing it to your awareness. It's showing you where the actual problem is. And so I would say, in a way, it's working. That level of intolerance is actually a clue. It's a helpful step. It's, the, it's showing you where the problem actually is. So let me just reread the question, make sure I answered it. If you're in a sympathetic state, fight or flight, can we use a rice machine to heal physical issues? Some people are extremely sick and cannot tolerate those treatments. I'm wondering why is that? So I would say no, because if you're in a fight or flight state, this, so, so again, this is, the stress response is universal. If it's a physical problem, if it's a mental, so if it's a physical trauma, a mental trauma, an emotional trauma, a spiritual trauma, the body will respond in the same, the same way. Immune system becomes dysregulated, hormone, you know, stress hormones get released doesn't matter what the cause is, the body is stimulating a response. So if you're in a sympathetic state, to me that is indicating that there is something that is triggering either the physiology, so there's something that is causing physical stress, so nutritional deficiency, chemical toxicity, metals, mold, plastic, something, you know, or you've got something that's trigger triggering them emotionally. Maybe they're in an unsafe environment. And the thing, the thing that's really, that's really quite crazy is if you're in an unsafe environment, but it's even more unsafe for you to become aware that you're in an unsafe environment, you'll never become aware that you're in an unsafe environment because that's more dangerous. This is a, a tricky situation that I got stuck in. So I would say if the, the, the natural state of the body is, is health, the natural state of the body is parasympathetic. That's the natural state of the body. So I would, I would say if the body is it's tending towards a sympathetic state. There is some kind of stimulus in the, the present environment that is, that is triggering unsafety. That is, that is saying that there's something unsafe here, and that needs to be addressed as the first priority. The Rife machine is, a, is an awesome tool, but it is not a cure all. It is not a fix all. You can't just fix every single problem with it. It's a really good tool. That's really good for certain things. So the things that I find it really useful for are removing, like encouraging cellular detoxification. So taking toxins from the cell to be released out of the cell. Sometimes cells hold toxicity for emotional reasons, though. So if you're trying to do this, it can trigger emotional, emotional uh, symptoms. And it can also be really helpful for uh, killing par parasites, pathogens and different types of organisms. But again, if you're going to kill a parasite, but you're not a vibrational state to empowerment, so if emotionally you can't feel empowered, and you kill the parasite, it, it's going to come back straight away. And what usually happens is, par parasites are really connected with codependency. So you, 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 you see it as a parasitic relationship, but it's actually codependent, you're actually getting something out of it, and you're just saying that it's a parasitic relationship, because parasites are just these like evil things that are never beneficial, where actually what's more likely happening is you've developed some kind of codependent state with the, with the parasite. So look at how the parasite serves you. Look at the codependency that you have in your life because it's there, you know, it, it's, it's always there. 
So if you, and I find if you work on that emotional root cause, you stop the codependency, you heal that, that emotional wound, the parasites cannot live inside you anymore because your immune system physically matches that state of empowerment that your emotional state is of strong boundaries. And the parasites, they can't inhabit that environment. Your body will kick them out. So it works on, on all of these levels. Angela says, I've been struggling for the last six months to figure out why my body is going through what it has been been going through. It's not enough for me to go off to, to really give you an answer there. I w what I would encourage you to do is if, you, if you're looking for some help, I offer a, a consultation called a root cause consultation that is designed to dig into the root cause of the problems. So it's looking at like testing, it's looking at symptoms, looking at trauma, all these different things to try and unearth what's happening with you and figure out why you developed the symptoms that you currently have, why you have the health problems you currently have, figure out why they're an adaptive response, and then start looking at what your best options are moving forward so that we can resolve them. If that's working on trauma, then that's that. If it's maybe we need dietary changes or supplements or stuff like that, then that's that. It's this is the the reason that I offer this consultation like this is it really helps me figure out where you are. And when I know where you are, like when I understand your current health dilemma, I can help you figure out what's going to be the next step for you. And then I can direct you towards that. And if that's something I can help you with, then I'll help you with it. Or if it's something that you're going to need to get somewhere else, then I can try and help you find another professional that can, that can help you with that. So if you need help with that, just reach out. Let me know. I'm more than happy to offer you a consultation. I'll reach out to you afterwards as well, actually. But let me know if you're interested. So let's just see. Okay, we've got, we've got two more. Cool. Every time I answer one, I get a new one. I'm, I, I really like this. <laughs> so uh, Christina, nice to have you, Christina. Let, let us know where you're where you're from. Let us know where you're, where you're coming from. Probio so she says, her question is, probiotics can help the food intolerance to pass foods. So it can. If the food intolerance is a physiological problem, so if the root cause of the food intolerance is in the physiological realm, so if you've lost the bacteria that you need to actually be able to break down, digest, and absorb these foods, and you're missing the right probiotics in the gut to be able to support the digestive process, so you need certain organisms to digest certain fibers. You need certain organisms to stimulate stomach acid production and to heal the gut lining so you can produce brush border enzymes. They also produce different enzymes themselves that help you digest food. So if it's if the problem is here, if the intolerance is physiological and you can't digest these foods because the, the organisms that you need to be able to digest the foods simply aren't present, then yes, probiotics are going to be a foundational part of that of that healing process but this isn't always the case food intolerance isn't always physiological very often can be a mental or emotional root cause problem so you really have to look at where the actual problem is if it's physical probiotics are going to be amazing they're going to be a game changer but if it's not physical they're not going to do that much you know what might happen is you take the probiotics and it starts to put you in a thought pattern or an emotional state where the real problem actually is so if you take the probiotics and they cause a, a negative reaction, like an intolerance reaction, and you feel a certain way, you might feel depressed, you might feel angry, you might feel sad, you might feel anything in between, that's probably where the root cause actually is. And that's where you need to look. Or if it causes you to trigger into a certain uh, behavioral pattern or it makes you think a certain way, then, so it, like, for example, it could trigger an eating disorder, for example. So you could take the probiotic and it triggers you into like, if you're bulimic, for example, like a binging purging cycle. So it's actually showing you where the root cause of the problem actually is. And that's where you need to do the work. So long story short, it can, but the root cause actually has to be there. Okay. Last question. Now my throat's starting to get a little, I wasn't planning on doing a very big live today, but there we go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So final question today from Chris. So can the same principles be applied to mycotoxins? Yes, absolutely. So mycotoxins have a physiological effect in the body. They have, uh, they'll have an associated, um, thought, thought process and an associated emotion as well. So they're, they're all connected. Thank you, Jonna. Jonna, Jonna just brought me some water. I'll just have a little drink. Thank you. So, so yes, this is, this is universally applicable. These are, this is the thing about metaphysics. These are principles that you can apply anywhere to anything, to any type of symptom, to, to everything. This, this is the thing. Like, these are universal laws. These are universal principles. So this is where you're going to find so many answers to questions that you, that you've had that you haven't been able to find. Because if you're just focused in the physical, 
And the problem isn't physical. You're going to just be chasing this forever and you'll never find the solution. So we have to open to those other realms, to the mental, the emotional and the spiritual. And we have to look at these things holistically. And they're all connected, you know, as I said. Next level holistic practitioners are going to be working on understanding that the physical, mental, emotional and spiritual are all connected. You cannot have dysfunction at one level and not have dysfunction at all of the other levels as well. It's not it's not possible. It, it just cannot happen. So if you have a problem somewhere, try to. So the physical is the most easy for us to interact with because you can't deny my gut hurts, my leg hurts. Oh, this is happening. You can't. You, it's there. It's reality. There's no way you can get around it. So what we need to do is try to try to bridge into higher levels of thinking. Like, how do I feel about this? What is my thought process around this symptom? What is my thought process around this problem in my life? What do I make this mean, like, spiritually? What is this meaning on my path? What is the higher meaning of this? We need to start asking these questions. And then you'll start to find the answers that you're looking for. I absolutely promise you healing is possible. I've done it. I'm still not fully healed, but I'll never be. It's a process. I like to. I don't, I don't like to say I'm healed. I like to say I'm healing because I think this is something that I'll literally do until the day that I die. And it's just le extra layers and layers and layers and levels of awesomeness in your life. So unless you're like doing a job that you love and feeling like you have purpose in your life and you've got great levels of health like there's an improvement that can be made and this is all healing having great relationships doing stuff you love making shitloads of money so you can do whatever the hell you want with your life like this is healing this is all part of healing it isn't just physical it's all of these other layers on top so that's everything for me today i hope you've you found this this interesting and helpful and maybe it's been a bit eye-opening for you I need to go to bed. <laughs> it's bedtime for me, so I'll see you soon. <laughs> Ciao.